The North Bay Echo Network is uh, proud to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the RCAF, and uh, we're really lucky to have in the studios uh, the bosses here. Colonel Gillette is uh, is here, and thank you, uh, Colonel, for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And also, CWO Pingatel is here, and uh, Chief, nice to have you in. Bon matin à tous. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for having us. So we're celebrating 100th, uh, the 100th anniversary of the RCAF. Uh, uh, maybe, Colonel, you can tell us a little bit about uh, about the celebrations that are happening, uh, I guess, this week. Everything's uh, really rolling out this week. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're we're unfortunately we're we're tied up with um, uh, Easter long weekend. It's kind of uh, uh, at the same time, so um, a, a lot of uh, people are focusing on that as they do every year. But uh, uh, this year, what we're we're able to do is on Thursday the twenty eighth, uh, we're going to do a flag raising ceremony up at uh, twenty two wing at our welcome wall, as we call it, uh, and then uh, immediately following that, we're going to do a second flag raising ceremony at City Hall. Uh, my thanks to uh, His Worship uh, the Mayor for um, for showcasing the RCAF at City Hall. And that'll be uh, starting at 10 o'clock at City Hall. And then over the weekend, um, something really special is that there's going to be an illumination of City Hall with a Air Force blue light uh, showcasing the, uh, the the flag. And that's this is something that's going to be done in uh, like hundreds of locations across the world. And North Bay is part of this um, this community of of showcasing the RCAF. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. I could say uh, with confidence that the RCAF isn't the, the largest air force in the world by any means, but its its reach is incredible, and its integration with other military personnel around the world is uh, is immense. It's respected around the world. Maybe talk a little bit about that, uh, Colonel. Uh, as you said, this illumination. Uh, ceremony where we're lighting things up blue all over is happening literally around the globe to celebrate the RCAF. And and I think that's out of respect of of how the world uh, views the RCAF. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, So it's not the biggest, it's one of the oldest uh, uh, air forces uh, in the world. And um, I, I think that the, 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 the importance of uh, of a military force, of an air force, is not necessarily in the the, the number of airplanes, the number of people that is uh, that is provided. It's it's uh, the capability that's provided. It's it's that engagement, that support to other countries that need us, to other forces that need us. And historically, uh, whether it is the RCEF, whether it's the Canadian Army or the uh, Royal Canadian Navy, the Canadian Armed Forces has been that partner, that loyal partner, that that dedicated partner, that dependable partner uh, when uh, when needed uh, across the world. Yeah. And uh, Chief, let's talk a little bit about the history a little bit too. Um, it, when, I, when I started doing a little bit of research 100 years ago, it was like they showed back in like 1909 that uh, we started flying aircraft out in the East Coast, but the RCAF at that time hadn't been formed yet. But Everything really started on the East Coast for uh, for the RCAF. Uh, absolutely, and you're absolutely correct. And yes, the RCAF is turning 100 years old, uh, but uh, there was presence of flyers and airplanes way before that, right? Uh, so uh, the 100th anniversary is basically the stood up of what the Air Force is right now. So, uh, and we're very proud to to, to be to be uh, there for 100 years. It's not every day that you turn 100 years old. And no, I wasn't around when we turned 100. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, we're looking very much forward to to all the activities and so forth. And yes, the, the history is a, is going to be showcased throughout. So the, the as I went through the history, I was a little surprised uh, as growing up as a kid. Uh, I remember you would always uh, learn about Billy Bishop was one of the first, you know. Uh, people that, well, the first to win the Victoria Cross. Um, I just assumed we had an Air Force back then, but Billy Bishop wasn't part of the, the Canadian Air Force. Correct, because it was part of the uh, Army Air Corps. Like a lot of the uh, forces, same thing with the Americans, uh, they were part of the uh, the Army, took over, was the early starters of the Air Force. And then eventually the creation of having a blue uniform Air Force uh, stood up, like I said, for us about 100 years ago. I, I was able to to be part of the celebrations at uh, um, at the base in Borden. I think it was a hundred years, a few years ago, right? It was pre pre COVID. But I never realized that Borden was a significant when it came to the Air Force or the Royal Canadian Air Force for us. I always looked at it as a, an army base, but it's not. No, it's not. And actually, it's the we call it the birthplace of the RCF uh, because it was, uh, if you want, to think of it as being the first uh, air wing. 
And that's why they train pilots uh, pre, uh, pre in between the two wars and eventually for World War II. So a lot of the, uh, the, the training was done in Borden. And when you look at Borden right now, there, you're absolutely correct. There is an army base to it. So there is CFB Borden, but there's also 16 wing Borden, which is the Air Force aspect. And that's where the bulk of Air Force occupations are being trained. So Borden is very significant. And, and uh, on that note, too, it, it, Borden has always been a training base, a training wing uh, for for all occupations. I mean, that's where the, uh, the 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 technicians that work on our aircraft in the RCF, that's where they get their training. That's where military police get their training. That's where mechanics on um, army vehicles get their training. That's where our cooks are trained. It's, it's always been a training establishment and kind of connected to the history of the RCF. Uh, to this day, the RCAF Academy, the Royal Canadian Air Force Academy, is actually in Borden, and that's where junior and senior leaders learn about the history of the RCAF and develop their skills uh, as leaders uh, uh, to lead the the next generation. So let's talk about the twenty two wing and, and how uh, because it, when I uh, arrived here in nineteen ninety one, uh, there used to be planes flying overhead. Uh, and, uh, but not today it has, it has a different mission altogether. And Colonel, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah. So the, the mission itself has, uh, has not really changed in that, um, North Bay has, has always been a NORAD base. Uh, let's be honest. It's since the, uh, the fifties when the underground complex was, uh, was constructed and we, we started doing that binational NORAD mission. That's always been the raison d'etre of 22 wing. Um, that's our primary mission. Everything that we do at the wing, whether it's uh, uh, financial support, whether it's the uh, the physical trainers at the gym, whether it's the vehicle techs, the cooks, everyone is supporting that mission, that primary mission, which is the most important in Canada, uh, the aerospace defense of Canada and North America uh, through NORAD. Uh, so that that hasn't really changed. But like you said, Scott, um, we don't have airplanes anymore here because the specific uh, the specific uh, flying uh, mission, if you will, to support that NORAD mission has slightly changed. We don't have the type of aircraft that used to fly here back in the day, such as the T-Birds and the Voodoo's. It's, it's just not uh, capabilities we have anymore. So that has slightly shifted, but uh, we have never swayed from the 24-7 NORAD support uh, that that is, again, the reason for 22-ing. When I uh, travel for business and I make presentations and uh, they ask, where are you from? And I say, North Bay. And you know what, what North Bay is famous for? Very, 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 very few people can ever say what we're famous for. It's almost like this hidden secret, even though strategically this base is, has a really, really important mission. Why do you think that is? Like if I went to Colorado, maybe because we see it in movies and stuff. That uh, you know why Colorado Springs, you know what's here? It's the mountain, the Cheyenne Mountain, and uh, all the movies. But North Bay doesn't seem to have that same uh, same allure. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because uh, when you think of it, they they constructed two uh, underground complexes. They they constructed here in North Bay and Cheyenne Mountain, right? So. Um, like you said, Scott, like it's maybe more highly mediatized in the U.S. with uh, with movies in the past. Um, but I, I think that uh, it's it's not just with people outside of uh, North Bay. I think a lot of people in North Bay actually don't know what we do at uh, 22 Wing. Uh, and uh, and what we've tried to do over the last couple of years is just try to spread that message. And it's something that, that I hope will continue in the years to come, not just the people outside of 22 Wing, but also to um, the people of North Bay. We want them to know what we're, we're doing. We want to share our, our history, uh, what, what that important mission is, because I think a lot of people just simply, they just don't know um, what we're doing. Uh, maybe the chief can comment on uh, that dynamic in Colorado Springs, because you work there. So. Yes, and I was there. But before I go on to uh, Sea Springs, uh, I would say that it's very important part of the being part of the community, right? Like, uh, North Bay has been here since 1954. So we're surprisingly, a lot of folks like you were mentioning don't know that we're here, but we're part of the community. And I think the community is part of us. So it's very important that we, we, we build that rapport and continue building that rapport. So being in Colorado Springs back in 1995, uh, very interesting, and yes, definitely being in China Mountain Air Station. So same process of what we have here in North Bay Underground Complex kind of stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I could mirror the, the 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 relativity of being here in North Bay and being in Colorado Springs, uh, but Colorado Springs being a bigger city also. Uh, and like you mentioned, you know, with the uh, there there the media is there, and as well as movies and so forth, where 
I don't think you run any kind of movies in North Bay, though we're open for business, right? <laughs> you know, it's, I, I actually had, and I know both of you know this person, I, I went out for a birthday celebration with Pat Moran. He, he just celebrated his 65th birthday, right? And I'm sure you maybe work with Pat somewhere along the line. But uh, I love hearing some of those old stories, right? Like, so Pat was here at the base when we had the Bowmark missile site. We had like nuclear weapons were, were tied into that and the whole logistics around that. So not only did we have a fighter group, but we had, you know, ground to air missiles, uh, nuclear missiles uh, at one time. This was you know, a pretty significant military complex. Mm -hmm. It sure was. And uh, um, the with that uh, that connection of the Bullmark missiles, that's that's really where we we began uh, having more and more of our binational partners here, the the US military. And my, my my father who was in the military before me would talk about this all the time. Like there was like tons and tons of Americans everywhere in North Bay, in Bagotville, up in the Saguenay as well, because there was the nuclear connection with the Voodoo uh, aircraft as well. And it, it, it was different times, right? Uh, we had multiple general officers here in North Bay, and it, it was it, it was just a... Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I actually didn't know that. We had general officers in North Bay? Sure, sure did, with, uh, with Fighter Group. In essence, it's uh, what exists now in, uh, in the Canadian NORAD region in Winnipeg used to all be here in North Bay. Uh, in the underground complex, if you've ever been, there's this this one room. It's kind of has the higher ceilings. Yes. Uh, so that was that was in essence where the the generals they they, they sat and did uh, their their mission as part of the fighter group. But it it it, it really picked up steam back in those days that that. The more of the grandeur of the mission here, and the 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 number of people that were that were working here supporting that. But just coming back to uh, what I was getting at of the the American partners. So that's always existed as part of NORAD because it's the only binational command that that exists. And to this day, seventy plus years later, um, every day side by side, Canadians and Americans sit doing that NORAD mission. And I think really that. That's what makes it special as well, the 22-ing, the relationship. Because, you know, Scott, you've seen these license plates in town, and you're like, oh, there's license plates from Texas and Hawaii and uh, Utah. Or, who are these people? Well, maybe 50 years ago, it was tourists. They were coming here for hunting and fishing. But um, it's it's American, sold, uh, American aviators that are working side by side with our uh, Canadian military members. And, and it's not just here. We... we it's I've learned over time it's Canadians are are in the United States working at their bases so it's side by side here yes and it's also side by side in Rome New York and Colorado Springs and all across North yeah. America Alaska uh, in uh, multiple space positions as well in Vandenberg Air Force Base in California uh, Cape Cod uh, in Thule Greenland like all over the place uh, I, I I don't know what the exact figure is but I'd, I'd argue that uh, uh, almost half of our positions, if not more, uh, of our community of aerospace controller and aerospace control operator, uh, their positions are not in Canada because of the nature of our of our community supporting operations. Even when we raise in rank, we are always doing operations, which is pretty unique compared to other um, other jobs in the military where you become more of an administrator in higher ranks. Well, we're still operators, um, even at the senior ranks. But really exciting um, opportunities for young people joining, and like they, the sky's the limit. If you wanna, you wanna be in this place, you wanna travel, to, you wanna see work in different countries. Like this is this is the community for 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 that. Yeah, and I, I've always told my kids if they ever wanted to get in, they have to be in the Air Force. Said because you want to be at the Holiday Inn and then go to battle, as opposed to be in a ditch <laughs> and go to battle. That's a, that's. That's just a personal preference. Um, the, but let's talk a little bit about history, um, because a, as we we said earlier on that that this uh, this mission that you have here is critical to our sovereignty as a country, uh, but not just us, but also the United States as well. What? Let me ask the simple question: What do you do? What does Twenty Two Wing do? So the the mission, uh, the primary mission, is to support the NORAD mission uh, to do the. Uh, the aerospace surveillance, the aerospace defense, 
um, of the North American uh, aerospace uh, with our partners, uh, the U.S. So day to day, what does that mean? Um, so it, it's uh, we use a series of radar systems and uh, and fighter aircraft and radios and whatever we need to to surveil the North North American aerospace, primarily the NORAD mission, or should I say historically, the NORAD mission has been to look north. It's the, the traditional foe of, uh, of NORAD was, uh, was Russia, and uh, the traditional historical mission was to look north. The radars were all designed that way to, to look outwards. Um, and that mission continues now. Uh, you, you see uh, often in the, in the media that there was an intercept uh, uh, north of Alaska or an intercept north, of, uh, uh, north in northern Canada. So that, that, that still happens. Um, Post 9-11, the, the mission changed slightly, where instead of just focusing up north or past uh, uh, past the Canadian reach, if you will, we had to look, start looking in uh, because uh, it wasn't just the traditional NORAD chess game or the Cold War type era uh, mission that we had to focus on. We had to focus inwards because every aircraft theoretically could be a threat to our national security, right? Um, so... It's the mission has changed, but every day, day in, day out, twenty four seven, our operators are sitting on a console, um, surveilling the uh, the airspace, and then when needed, uh, we work with our fighter aircraft uh, in Canada, and we do an intercept, um, and that's what you'll see in the news, right? You'll see a, a fighter one aircraft. last week, I think, yeah, a fighter aircraft uh, comes up behind an aircraft. It could be an airliner, it could be. Um, could be a balloon, right? We've seen mm. that uh, recently, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the job that we do. It's uh, really, I, I tell my kids that I, I get paid to play video games because uh, it's, in essence, it's it's that. It's it's uh, using the, the, the network of systems that we have, radar and radio, and then if need be, the fighter aircraft to identify what's out there and ultimately defend Canada from anyone that wants to do anything bad to us. I, I've had the the honor of sitting in during an exercise uh, that you've gone through, and this was a, an internal um, situation where with airliners and, and and planes and things. And I think I was allowed because I have a terrible memory and I wouldn't be able to share any of your secrets. Um, but I was so when you said uh, tell my kids we do video games, I, that was an exercise. I uh, had to have a shower afterwards because I was sweating. It was there was so tension filled. Everybody else was like calm calm, calm. And, and then there was a debriefing afterwards, how we could have done it better. But that's the thing that people have to understand. It's not like you're, you're doing nothing. You're just looking at scopes. You train, train, train constantly. It never stops the training that takes place and the, the intensity. And when an exercise like that happens, people should know too, that there's a telephone and by the way, maybe it's changed, but when I saw it, it was like the crappiest telephone in the whole place. That's the one that actually is at the prime minister's office. So before anything's fired or anything happens that uh, life could be lost, it's really the prime minister or someone at that level that can actually say whether or not that happens. That's not not at your pay grade. So it's, uh, it is, it's the training part that I think was a big learning part for me to understand how much training you do. You constantly train. Yeah, we, we do, and we, we, we do exercises like that every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. And we literally could do the same exercise over and over and over, um, and sometimes we do, um, and you'll learn something different every time, right? And I think it's, it's, that's what makes the operators as, appear to be as calm as they are, is that it's so automatic to them it's like riding a bike, right? It's yeah. they go through the motions over and over and over, so that every motion they do, they're just so comfortable with it, so that if something really happens, um, that it's not a simulation, that they're going to have that those tools in their tool bag, and then they can just focus on applying those lessons they learn in a real live situation. And we've seen real live situations, and the operators, yeah, they get maybe a bit more perky in their chairs and excited. But they go through the motions, right? We have checklists. We have procedures. We have uh, standard operating procedures. We have uh, tech, uh, TTPs, as we call them, techniques, tactics, and procedures that we follow them because um, when a situation becomes more stressful, we need to rely on that training, rely on those uh, those SOPs and on those the things that we've learned to 
they, it's just part of part of us, right? right? It's part of us. And and on occasion, um, <clears throat> it wasn't that long ago. I think there was a um, uh, an aircraft flying Southern Ontario, basically, and I and something happened. Either its radar was off, or something was happening, and it wasn't communicating, and it was flying towards Toronto or something. And this was real world stuff that was happening. But you have to go through these training because it turns out it was just a a, a simple mistake by the pilot. And it could have been a massive tragedy if everybody wasn't on their game. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes that's what it is, right? It's it's a pilot that has not uh, is not squawking his code or his or her code. That's it's a four digit unique identifier that every aircraft has. Maybe they they indicated the wrong one. Maybe they flashed a number that uh, that identifies something else. Um, maybe it's broken. Maybe uh, air crew are having a medical emergency, right? Um, maybe it's an aircraft that's having issues, like smoke in the cockpit or or has an electrical problem. Um, sometimes it's just someone that just didn't know and is doing something they're not supposed to. The best example I can give for that is uh, is we do these uh, these uh, these TFRs, these temporary flight restriction areas, where it's just a big circle around the area that we're, we we want to defend. Um, we recently did this uh, for the president's visit um, last year now already. Um, where it's just a sterile circle in the ge geographical area where no one is allowed to fly in. And some pilot in, in their Cessna aircraft just out on a sightseeing day or showing their family around just accidentally flies in because they didn't read their 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 notice that, that on that particular day um, they weren't allowed there. So a lot, a lot of these things, it's not people actually wanting to do bad things. A lot of these things is just some, something happens, something, something out of the ordinary happens, but that's when we still have to react to ensure that it's not something nefarious. I remember Colonel Mallow uh, shared with me back when he was in command when the, when the Vancouver Olympics were on, and, and they he talked about those rings in Vancouver, which you had, by the way, uh, North Bay had a significant role in the safety of all those people from all over the world in Vancouver. They were part of that. So planes were flying 24-7 up in the air, and he was sharing, but he said the I didn't know this part. It was like uh, a cargo plane. Um, pilots will get bonused if they get there faster and save gas. So sometimes they move up or down in jet streams and different things just to get there faster and and save gas. But sometimes they could they, they would come close to those zones and uh, and they would have to be you know escorted back out again. And I asked uh, Colonel Mallow. I said, "So what does the pilot say when you get up beside you know the aircraft?" And he says you really don't have to say much. <laughs> they kind of get the message when an F-18 is flying beside you. Yeah, but even that, like it's scripted, uh, like there's specific uh, verbology that that the pilot will say, that we'll say when uh, aircraft you have entered a restricted area. Uh, again, it's going back to the training, right, Scott? It's mm -hmm. not to make the stuff up on the fly. It's all trained and scripted so that... Uh, we don't make those mistakes. Hey, Chief, you can mention the uh, you were there at the Olympics yourself. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. But I would add on to all those great conversation. What the boss is saying also is that to be part of the, to be vigilant, right? And that's what the training, training and training and training. We train as we fight. We fight as we train, like we say. But being extra vigilant that it's become second nature for our folks to do our job. Mm -hmm. And every individual down on the up floor, as you visited, have a part to play, but also part of a team. Right, so they're never alone. Even if they do have a brain fart, they're able to, to rely on their buddy to to help them out and so forth. So back to the Olympics. Yeah, I did all the pre exercises for the uh, 2010 Olympics in Vancouver. At that time, I was part of a, a mobile unit, so I spent pretty much uh, 18 months away from the home doing the pre exercises and then setting up the radar and uh, for a two week of the Olympics. A uh, great opportunity, great place, obviously, when you're in British Columbia, uh, and and to see all those people and to be part of that. All right, and and I would add on to one of the other stuff too that we uh, that we do. Part of the North Bay is implicated all the time. Is obviously the Olympics, but all the G8s, G20s uh, coming up in 2026 will be the soccer world tournament. Oh, you that's coming massive, up. So yeah. we are in uh, in preparations and in practice, and North Bay will have a great part to play again because we manage our space, and that's our raison d'être. And that's so what we're Chief, doing. So, Chief, you say space. We have a massive amount of space. Correct. So how? How is it we even technically that we could see what's happening? So to give an example, because I had, uh, again, the honor to fly to Alert. And then when I had that opportunity, I flew from Trenton to Alert. And uh, I soon found out that, and this is because we look at maps uh, in a book in most cases. 
So flying from Vancouver to Halifax is shorter than Trenton to Alert. That's how big our country is, right? Alert's the most northern uh, habited. Permanently habited yeah. uh, post, yeah. In the world, right? And so it's a massive. How do, how do we, how do you <laughs> protect us? <laughs> so obviously, like we mentioned, we have radar stations. You mentioned the, the line sites. So the radar stations are spread out. Uh, across the north, uh, coastal radars. Uh, we also share radars with uh, Nav Canada, Transport Canada, and as well as some of the radars from the United States also. There's always an overlap. Uh, I've talked about mobile radars. So we have about uh, two or three mobile radars that are deployable at any time and point. Uh, we use assets uh, such as the AWACS from the states, either from uh, Alaska or Oklahoma, that we can use as assets to monitor airspace and so forth. We talk about space, space itself, satellites. Satellites are also used to do some monitoring and so forth. So Pretty much, you name it, we have it, and we're able to use it to build a picture. Um, and, and that's how we do business. And fortunately, though, the size of our country sometimes could be our worst enemy. It's so vast. And we saw it with the balloons, right? Yeah. Balloons coming in and, and as a major uh, uh, issue is where they were flying. Maybe there's not a lot of radar coverage, uh, which pause itself, cause itself to be its own challenge, uh, not only for, for seeing the asset, but also for the, the radios to be able to communicate. Uh, so those are, uh, I would say, uh, things that are due to the nature of the country uh, being so vast and, and being, when you look at the population of Canada being basically at the border, uh, there's a lot of vast area where there's unknown, right? Uh, so it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But uh, we're keeping an eye. If we're, uh, I have no doubt you are. Uh, and and from a, from a history standpoint, how far we've come with technology. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, the base is part of our community and, and vice versa. And there's a lot of people that have retired here. And when I, uh, I've had a couple of occasions in the coffee shop speaking to some more senior people, and they talked about when they were a kid, uh, they used to, in our area, used to stand on towers with binoculars. That was sort of the, that was the first iteration of the trade, right? Of, of what you do today. Is that yeah, yeah, hundred hundred percent. Like, uh, um, when you when you think of it, uh, our community of uh, of aerospace controllers and aerospace control operators, like you can date it all the way back to uh, like like what you just mentioned, observers, right? It's the the earliest form of early warning is human beings with with their eyeballs seeing airplanes coming across the English Channel and calling in on a on a radar or a uh, or, or whatever type of device. Uh, of a, a teletype or tele telegraph, you know what I mean? To say, hey, they're coming, uh, and and that's just that's just what we still do, right? We still do that basic function of of doing the airborne early sort of air, early warning of aircraft coming towards us, and then uh, providing that control instructions to the aircraft to go and take care of business. So it's it, we we really we. We've evolved tremendously. We we now uh, have so much more uh, assets uh, at our disposal, whether it's ground-based, uh, uh, airborne platform, space-based, as, as the chief mentioned as well. Um, but it's still the basic same mission, right? It's seeing something coming and doing something about it. Um, so it it's just has it's changed dramatically, but it's still the same mission. The same basic fundamental. You send a blip and hopefully it pings back and you have information. So it's like technology. We went from observers with binoculars, maybe on the ground or flying in a, in a biplane, to satellites in a span of not even 100 years. That's it's a, Yeah, probably in both of your careers, like the incredible amount of technology, well, even space, right? For your career start, you, you Sapphire wasn't launched. So now, now someone's in your ops room looking in outer space. And, and because we hear this in the news, on occasion, right, uh, you'll, you'll hear Russians uh, encroaching and then we push them back. Why do they do that? And I'm assuming we do it as well. <laughs> why, why do they do that? So it's the, the traditional NORAD mission it has been, it's just a, it's a strategic chess game is what it is, right? It's, it's we do one move, they do one move, just to show presence, to show ability that we can still do that, right? Um, so it, it's it's demonstration of capability to to show that that capability is still relevant, um, and that's in essence that's that's, that's the the whole raison d'etre of the NORAD mission is is to to prove that we still have the capability to deter 
any type of aggression or any type of yeah. uh, of aggressive uh, demonstration. So, so everybody's testing everybody, and yeah. it's like and I'm I'm sure if they went up one time and nobody came to visit them, it'd be like uh, nobody came to see us. <laughs> so that's a in 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 talking to F eighteen pilots that have done these intercepts, they say yeah, it's pretty cordial, right? It's uh, it's uh, these Russian aircraft are up there. We go intercept them. We're communicating, um, kind of like Top Gun, you know, communicating. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 they're going through their procedures, and yeah, they know everyone knows what's next. So they'll probably turn left or right at a certain point because that's what they've historically always done. Um, but it's to continue to show that we have that that capability uh, to be able to continually to deter any type of escalation. That's what we're there for. That's that's the, ultimately what the NORAD role is, is to ensure to show presence and then deter uh, and prevent escalation. And, and as you said, when they don't turn that right turn that then, they then, normally do then, every then, time. And we make them turn left, turn left <laughs> and turn right. So we're, now we're we're into our training and let's, let's keep moving forward. Well, this 100th anniversary, uh, we're celebrating and uh, any special events that are happening at the base this year at the 22 wing. Uh, so other than the uh, the flag raisins we've already mentioned, uh, every event that we're doing this year, we we really were putting a 100th anniversary spin to it. I mean, we're wearing 100th anniversary patches all year, right? And we're going to continue to do that. Um, the uh, We're going to have a... Uh, uh, a, a nice uh, 100th anniversary gala or mess dinner, as uh, as as we call them. So that'll be uh, that'll be something that we're really looking forward to. Um, it, we're going to be holding that at the Voyager Aviation uh, Campus in one of the hangars that formerly was a hangar yeah. that housed RCF aircraft. I don't know if you've been in one of those before, but there's actually still the roundel on one of the floors there, right? So that that obviously is going to be a chance for us to showcase our history, uh, our heritage. But every event, whether it's Armed Forces Day as well on uh, on June nineteenth, that's going to have another heavy uh, focus on the hundredth anniversary. But we're really um, we're 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 showcasing the importance of a hundred years of RCEF in everything that we're doing. Chief. Yeah, and and I would say also like you're looking at the Battle of Britain coming up in September as well as Remembrance Day, we'll have a huge Air Force uh, uh, showcase on those. Obviously, the Battle of Britain. Uh, celebrating the Battle of Britain Air Force, uh, but as well as Remembrance Day and so forth. And like the boss said, we uh, it's actually started even last year. We started having a bit of preliminary events uh, with mess dinners, with a, an RCF theme, uh, showcasing all the banners across the cities. Uh, if you go to the airport, there's a 100th anniversary banner. There's some at uh, City Hall. Uh, so we're we're quite present and we're quite proud. Again, it's not every year you turn 100, right? Yeah. So, and ho- hopefully this year... Uh, uh, for Armed Forces Day, which is kind of the premier event here for the community. The last two years, we've kind of been building up. Uh, two years ago was our first Armed Forces Day in three years because of COVID, um, and it was very well attended. The second year, we had more um, uh, demonstrations uh, available. And then this year, we're getting the trifecta. So we're getting the Snowbirds, the Skyhawks, um, and the uh, the full F-18 uh, demonstration team. Wow. It's kind of building back up yeah. from nothingness now. So we're really looking forward to getting back to the 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 grandeur of the uh, what an armed forces day is for 22 and i think it's only fitting that it's for the 100th anniversary that we're back in full force um i mean it'll likely be the the most well attended uh, armed forces day we've ever seen hopefully we're going to get we've asked for the um, the mascot the the rcf 100 mascot it's it's this eagle uh um type uh uh, individual, so I don't know if the chief is going to be wearing the costume or wow, not. But chief, uh, you've come a long way. No, he'll be. <laughs> That's uh, the only costume you wear. I'll be walking around with. Uh, with okay, you. <laughs> we'll find we'll find someone else to do that. Uh, maybe you could do that, Scott. You so. know what? Yeah, I'd do anything for uh, the RCF. Are you kidding? You know that. Um, well, uh, Chief, thanks very much for coming in, uh, Colonel Gillette. Thank you uh, for coming in. Um, just on a personal note, wh- where do you head to next, Colonel? So uh, I I. I, I actually found out, so I, uh, I got my message uh, for what my next job is. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a year-long course uh, in uh, Toronto. It's called the National Securities Program. Um, it's very similar to the to the uh, the course that uh, the former Wing Commander Mark LaChapelle did. He did it in the United States, but um, we go there for a year. It's about 20 to 25 people across the entire Canadian Armed Forces, including some civilians, uh, some f- uh, foreign uh, students. We get about two or three spots a year for uh, Royal Canadian Air Force officers like myself. 
and it's a uh, an opportunity to really think at the strategic level and focus on uh, preparing myself for future senior uh, senior appointments. So that's that's what I'm headed off to Toronto for a year. For a year, yeah. is your family coming with you? They are not. No. Yeah. So yeah. so you're going to work then. <laughs> I, I, I am. <laughs> that's that's the. It's a college. What is it? Yeah, it's the uh, Canadian Forces College. That's it's, it. Uh, is located in Nor- North York. Yeah, it's right in the like. It, you would never know. I didn't know it was there, and I, I used to live down in Toronto. It's this incredible college. It's right there. That, like you said, I've been there. It's like people from all over the world attend for the the, stri- the strategic, in depth thinking, and and it helps uh, people like yourself to. It's like okay, we need to do this before I move on to the next step and the next step. That's right, and uh, and it's not a secret, so I can share that my successor's already been named. It's uh, someone that that twenty two wing knows already. It's. Uh, uh, Colonel Joe Oldford. So he was uh, he was the former uh, commanding officer of Twenty One Squadron, and uh, he'll be replacing me uh, this summer. Sometime in July, we'll be having a uh, a ceremony, and uh, the chief has promised to get back to a uh, a real parade, a marching parade what? for this summer. So uh, um, chief, it's a full time, and be- chief. yes, full bells and whistles. Hopefully, the weather will hold, and we'll <laughs> we'll have a full blast parade. Oh, uh, that's great. That's great to see. It's it's and thank you both for your service and. More than anything else, and I don't mean that flippantly, like it's I, – I understand now that I've made a number of friends the, the amount of sacrifices you and specifically your family. That's why I mentioned – I said, is your family coming with you? Because that's some of the things – so you're leaving for a year and you're just doing deep study and your family's in another location. Like that's that's kind of the, almost the norm where you see you're, you're always departing, coming back, and I know it happens for both of you. So thank you to your families – and, and thank you to both of you for, and I know all the other people that do all this incredible work. Thank you both. It's our pleasure. Thank, thank you for having us. Happy anniversary, 100 years of the RCAF, and uh, we hope to have uh, more special guests in to talk about this. Thank you both. <laughs>